All right, let's get started. Um, good afternoon uh, for those of you who are in Stockholm. Uh, good morning if you are in uh, California. Uh, very welcome to this uh, event organized by the Swedish House of Finance at the Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, my name is Magnus Dahlqvist and I'm a professor of finance and on the faculty uh, here. Today, Professor Annette Wissing Jorgensen will give a talk uh, on stock returns and Federal Reserve communications. Before we move into the program, I would like to inform you that the event will be recorded and we expect to finish at 5.30 uh, at 5.45 at the very latest. To begin, uh, I would like to uh, give the word to Kaisa Lindstol, who is uh, chair of the Tula Foundation. And uh, over to you, Kaisa. Thank you, Minus. <clears throat> the Scandia Award is funded by the Tula Foundation at Scandia. And the foundation wants to increase knowledge of how long term savings can contribute to a sustainable society. And, and we therefore uh, support research in the area. And in addition to the Scandia Award, uh, we also provide uh, graduate and postgraduate scholarships and um, master and bachelor thesis awards. Professor Annette Wessing Jorgensen is the receiver of Scandia's Research Prize for 2020 on long term savings. And Annette receives the prize for her contributions with relevance for banking, insurance, and uh, financial services. Annette is particularly recognized for her work on uh, the interactions between uh, economic policy and regulations, regulation and uh, the capital market. We have already sent Annette some flowers, and <clears throat> today we will send this diploma to Annette Sign, and the diploma is signed by the board of the foundation. And of course, we will send the price check of uh, 10,000 euro. So uh, with this, I, we would like to give you my, our warmest congratulations for the prize. And uh, looking forward to your talk, I want to hand over the microphone to Magnus. All right, thank you. And well deserved. Um, <laughs> Annette will soon um, present her research, but first I would like to engage you all by asking three questions uh, related to her topic. Um, we are simply curious about your views on the Fed and the stock market. We will use the polls inside uh, Zoom. And here is the first uh, warm up question for you. So um, I think I, I'll, I'll stop here. Um, we see that um, two have said zero. Um, the highest uh, is the number eight, uh, eight meetings uh, per year, which is also um, the uh, correct answer for scheduled meetings. And um, the researchers have documented interesting patterns in global stock returns around these meetings. So here is the second question. So how much of the realized return in the US and international stock markets is approximately earned in the weeks around the FOMC meetings? So here we have 63% um, saying uh, between zero and 50% of the so-called equity premium, 26% um, between 50 and 100%. And the correct answer is that a large chunk of the average realized return is earned in the weeks um, uh, around the FOMC meetings. Um, one study shows that about 80% actually happens at the same day, but uh, there are nuances in this and Annette and her co-authors have uh, found important return cycles that we will hear about uh, later. The third question for you, is uh, related to the so-called Fed's uh, put. So do you think the Fed responds to poor stock returns, writing a so-called Fed put? So a uh, clear majority um, have said uh, yes, or answered yes to the question. 
And uh, I'm very curious about hear about this uh, from Annette and and the evidence that she has uh, provided before and, and in this talk. So with this start, I would like to, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Annette Wissing Jorgensen. Annette has written extensively on a wide range of topics in asset pricing and corporate finance. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm particularly fond of Annette's work on the demand and supply in the treasury markets and her recent, uh, recent research on how economic policy interacts with the capital markets. I find Annette's work uh, very inspiring and I very much look forward to hearing about her uh, latest findings. So Annette has um, 30 to 40 minutes for her presentation. During the presentation, you can ask questions in the Q&A box, uh, which is at the lower part of your screen. And uh, after presentation, we will have some time to answer some of these questions uh, in, the, uh, in a Q&A session. So please take the opportunity to ask Annette on her research and on her views. Without further ado, I give the digital floor to Annette, please. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much, Magnus, and thank you very much for the award. Uh, it's a great honor to receive this award since the Tula Foundation has been committed to supporting research on long-term savings for a long time. So it's exciting to, to uh, know that my research is considered relevant for actual investors out there. Today, I'm going to speak about the interaction between monetary policy and asset markets with a focus on the stock market. And I thought it would be uh, more fun that I give you the highlights from a whole research agenda rather than talking you through one paper in more detail. So I'm just gonna mention the list of papers here up front and then you can go back to the relevant ones for reference if interested. Let me instead summarize what are the three main questions that we're gonna be discussing today and what are my answers? And then I'll of course show you a bunch of evidence to support that. So the first question is how much the Fed affects the average stock market return. So it turns out actually that for the last several decades, the Fed appears to be responsible for the whole realized equity premium in the US as well as worldwide in the sense that average stock returns over bills have been positive in the periods where the Fed is doing something and have actually on average been slightly negative uh, in periods where the Fed is not doing something. I'm gonna argue that this is due to policy being unexpectedly accommodating. Uh, you can think of how long uh, we all thought we would be at the zero lower bound after the financial crisis. I think uh, from survey evidence, uh, that you know, most of us thought we would uh, lift off much sooner than we had, so that's one example. In terms of the asset pricing mechanism, it turns out actually that the Fed has a large effect, uh, not only through the short rate, but also through the risk premium. So I'll show you some graphs on that. The second question is how information gets from the Fed to the stock market. And the main interesting finding there is that it's not perhaps the way that one would expect. Uh, it's not through only the formal releases or speeches, but also through some more informal channels like interviews with the media and talking to financial newsletters or Fed watchers and so forth. Um, even more subtle, a lot of this information is what journalists would call unattributed or on background. Uh, that just means that it's an interview where the person being interviewed is not allowing their name to be quoted in the article. Um, and furthermore, if you think about what is the main predictor of this kind of communication? It turns out that the key thing is when the top policymakers interact, that's where the information is created and, sh and, and shared. And subsequently, there seems to be an information flow to markets. The third question I'd like to address is why exactly are policymakers uh, using unattributed communication rather than formal releases or speeches? So this could either be the institution communicating in this fashion, or it could be individuals that are communicating. I want to talk you through, in particular, the role of individual uh, policymaker communication in the sense that, uh, and this becomes relevant in the sense that when you have monetary policy made by a large committee, as is the case in the US, as well as at the ECB, for example, you're going to have policymaker disagreements. There's going to be hawks and dogs, and that results in communication being also an individual, uh, an individual communication from a given policymakers uh, 
maker in the sense that if you as a policymaker succeed in moving market expectations going into the policy meeting, then you have more bargaining power because the Fed uh, and probably central banks more broadly are reluctant to not deliver on market expectation because it makes them look a bit like they're flip-flopping if they don't deliver on what they have made the market expect ahead of time. So I'll talk you through how this can be solved in what one could call a quiet cacophony of, uh, of uh, policymakers revealing internally known information in order to support their case. The reason it becomes quiet is a lot of the information that is in, that's useful is classified. So think of staff forecast and colleagues views and so forth. And then I'm gonna finish by discussing the pros and cons of this kind of unattributed communication more broadly, including a discussion of Pres President Lagarde's recent effort to cut back on this kind of communication in the ECB context. All right, so let's talk about how much the Fed affects the stock market. Um, the standard approach here is to take a narrow window, say 15 or 30 minutes around FOMC announcements, and then measure whether unexpectedly high short rates lower the stock market and conversely. And that turns out to be the true, the, the, that turns out to be the case. I'm interested here, though not only in the correlation, but also in whether on average there has been effect. So whether the Fed has affected the average realized stock returns. And the narrow window approach suggests that it has not. However, as you probably are well aware, the size of monetary policy news is generally small. By the time you get to the market, you know, we more or less know what will happen. So that means that news about monetary policy seems to be coming out, you know, not only right around the announcement, but also in between meetings. And furthermore, one could say even on the announcement day, perhaps news get out before the announcement as people involved uh, talk to people outside the central bank. So the main contribution of our work is to study the full return, the full cycle of stock returns from one meeting of the uh, Federal Open Market Committee until the next meeting. And I wanna just show you, just to uh, get started here, uh, a graph that we are building on from Luca and Munk who study the period just before the announcement. Okay, so here's their graph. This is called the PFMC drift. It shows how the market is evolving leading up to the FOMC announcement. That's the dotted vertical line. And what they show is that over the period stated, the average stock return in the 24 hour period leading up to, to the announcement, but not including now the announcement was around 50 basis points. Okay, so that's a lot, right? There's eight meetings per year. So that works out to four percentage points per year. That's gonna be a big part of the overall stock market return. Now they actually do not link this to the Fed. They say this is a puzzle because monetary policy news coming out would have to be systematically positive and leaks are quote, unrealistic from an institutional viewpoint. All right, so here's our, here's our main graphs. Let's look not only at what I'll call day zero in FOMC cycle time, so the day right around the day of the announcement. Let's look at all the days, okay? so. In the left graph here, I'm focusing on the US stock market and I'm graphing the five day excess return on stocks over bills. On the X axis, I'm graphing the days since the FOMC meeting. I'm dropping the weekends. So 10 is two weeks later, 20 is four weeks later and so forth. The number along the axis, that's just the value on the, or the number along the line is the value on the X axis. So, if, so for example, uh, the high dot here at minus one means that if you held stocks on days minus one, zero, one, and two in FOMC cycle time, then you would on average earn about 50 basis points. We knew that from Luca and Munch. So the contribution here is to show that actually, once you look at the whole cycle, there's not only one return peak, there's actually three. And so the sense in which the Fed has driven the whole equity premium is that if you look here on the y-axis, zero is here. And so you can see that if I can convince you that these peaks in these even weeks, uh, weeks zero, two, four, and six are due to the Fed, then that means that the average return over this post 94 period has been driven by uh, information from the Fed. Whereas in these odd weeks, weeks one, three, and five, if anything, the returns are negative. Now to the right, uh, I'm showing international stock markets. The blue 
is developed markets excluding the US and the various emerging markets. I've actually also grafted specifically for Sweden and it looks pretty similar. So this basically shows that the Fed seems to, if I can convince you this is all driven by the Fed, the Fed seems to have a very large influence, not only in the US stock market, but also in world stock markets. So one can run regression to show that these effects are significant in the first column. I'm just running daily excess returns on the dummy for whether you win one of these even weeks and you can see there's lots of stars here. All right, so let's think about the long-term investors. How could one perhaps uh, have benefited from this in the past? So if you consider various trading strategies, the one that will do the best is if you only hold stocks in the even weeks, then you have a pretty high average return and you're basically sitting out a bunch of slightly negative returns in the odd weeks and there's not much difference in volatility between the even and the odd weeks. So by, if you sit out the odd weeks, you're sitting out half of the variance. And that means that you can get a really good sharp ratio. You can actually, in the past, you could adopt, you've had, you would have had a twice as high sharp ratio if you held stocks only in the even weeks as if you had held in all weeks. Um, the economist wrote up the paper a while back and they uh, had us construct how much $1 would have grown from the start of 1994 until the article was written at the end of 2015 uh, under these various investment strategies. And the light blue line here at the top illustrates the even week strategy. The $1 would have grown to more than $12 by the end of 2015. Actually, if you had invested in odd weeks because the returns are slightly negative, you can see how you would have lost money. And the average of those two lines then gives you the actual growth. So, I need to convince you that this is due to news uh, from the Fed. So what my argument will be that these high even week returns are driven by monetary policy news, which over this post 1994 period has been surprisingly good for the stock market and has reached markets through informal communications channels. All right, so here's my best picture, I think, for arguing that this is actually due to monetary policy news. This graph is based on data from before 1994. So back then, there were lots of changes to the target. They moved in smaller increments back then. And a lot of those changes, about two thirds of the changes actually took place in between the formal FOMC meetings. That's nice for understanding when the Fed is doing its uh, discussion and its decisions. The graph here plots the five day probability of a target change over the FOMC cycle and you can see that there are four peaks in this series as well. The peaks are actually slightly delayed by one to two days. That's because the literature dating these changes uh, dates them based on when the market could learn about policy changes from open market operations, which is a bit after the meeting. Uh, back then there were no FOMC announcements. I'll get back to that later on. Okay, so this doesn't say what exactly is going on inside the Fed, but it says that, okay, just sort of reveal preference, that's when the decision-making is happening. Another argument for causality is to think about how monetary policy news uh, affects the covariance between futures, Fed funds futures and stock returns. So a monetary policy shock, let's say a contractionary shock should be bad for the stock market. So you would expect that if there's a lot of monetary policy news, this covariance would be lower or more negative less positive equivalent. And that's what you see in this graph, that if you calculate this covariance by week of the FMC cycle, you can see that it's systematically lower in these even weeks. Finally, we have, we have of course controlled for other things that could matter and found that it doesn't seem to drive out the even week effect. Now, why, where does this odd pattern come from? So one possibility is the frequency of what's called discount rate requests. So, there's not much activity in the discount window in the US generally. And so these requests may not, uh, may not by themselves be that important. However, each of the 12 reserve banks around the US, they have to send in a discount rate request to the board of governors in Washington, at least every two weeks. And here quoting former Fed Governor Meyer, this is a device for influencing the policy discussion in between the meetings. And so since everyone will want to have updated their discount rate request before the FOMC meeting in order to have as much influence as possible. Then as long as everyone updates at least every two weeks, 
then every two weeks, one will have a full set of fresh requests to discuss in the even weeks. And so that's a conjecture for why the even weeks seem to be when a lot of uh, Fed uh, decision making or debate is going on. In terms of the mechanism, over this post-94 period, let me show you a few graphs to show that monetary policy news seems to have been systematically positive. So this is a graph of the five-day change in Fed fund futures where we use a longer contract uh, during the zero lower bound period. And you can see now it's flipped around. There seems to be a lower, uh, you know, a reduction in Fed fund futures in these even weeks consistent with systematically accommodating news. Magnus mentioned also the Fed put. Here's kind of a fascinating graph in that if you, suppose you sort stocks, suppose you sort uh, daily stock returns into five buckets based on how well the market did over a five day period. Okay, so that's what's on the x-axis here. And then suppose you keep track of how the stock market is doing today as a function of how it did in the past, then you see this very odd pattern that if today is an even weekday and over the past week the market did terribly, the return is really high. Okay, you can see it looks like, uh, you, you, you know, you start, look, look, you start seeing something that looks like a put option. So uh, that happens importantly only in even weeks, not in odd weeks. So in other words, there's mean reversion in the stock market in even weeks which would be consistent with a surprisingly strong Fed put that after the market tanked, the Fed came in sort of more gung-ho than the market had expected. And that resulted in high realized returns. It's actually less likely that this FMC cycle is due to a risk premium because we have presented, you know, at many places, including lots of hedge funds and the even week pattern was not known before we documented it as far as we know. And in order for that to be a risk premium, presumably investors need to know when they're supposed to require a risk premium. All right, so in terms of the asset pricing channel here, uh, the, I showed you the graph of the Fed Fund futures, but actually the drop in the Fed Fund futures rate is quantitatively small. What seems to matter more is that the Fed affects the risk premium. So here using a, an options-based measure of the equity premium for the one month horizon from Ian Martin, you can see that there's large reductions in the risk premium uh, in these even weeks. Okay, so in other words, there's news about discounting and when we discount less, either through the short rate or the risk premium, but that's gonna lead to high realized returns during those uh, same times. So how does the Fed lower the risk premium? Uh, the Fed doesn't say we'll do whatever it takes. They say they'll act as needed. I put here an example from August 2007 at the sort of start of the housing crisis uh, where the Fed put out a release after the stock market had done poorly over the past week. And the release says that financial market conditions have deteriorated, downside risk to growth has increased. Therefore, we're monitoring the situation and we are prepared to act as needed. In, res in response, the stock market uh, went up on that news. It might be more fun to show you actually an example from the COVID crisis. So, the Fed's whatever it takes type announcement during COVID is on March 23rd in the morning at 8 a.m. That's when they announced that they would do unlimited QE for treasuries and MBS. And they also would go into corporate bond purchases, which was a first for the Fed. So it was uh, the announcement was before the market opened. But uh, so I can't show you, you know, standard intraday data. However, exchange traded funds often trade beforehand. And so one can document both daily um, and as well as intraday data using the VIXY ETF. Here I'm showing you just the daily version and you can see a large drop in the price of this, which roughly maps to VIX. In another paper, I estimate that the equity risk premium for the next one year period dropped by two percentage points on this particular day on March 23rd. Okay, so the Fed seemed to have a large effect on this premium. So in this first uh, FMC cycle paper, we didn't have that much to say about how information reaches the market in the sense that we showed that it wasn't, there's no effect of controlling for information releases or speeches. We gave some examples of, you know, a few cases where internally you know, inf information reached the market, but in newer work, we have uh, 
gone all out trying to study the inner workings of the Fed uh, through the calendars of the governor, governors to try to sort out what's going on in these even weeks that seem to lead to information dissemination to markets. All right, so let's turn then to our second main question. How is information transmitted from the Fed to markets? So the calendars, uh, aside from the chairs calendar, uh, are not public information, but one can submit a Freedom of Information Act request. That's what in Scandinavia would probably be called act insect. And we submitted a whole bunch of these and we use the calendars to study which interactions seem to lead to information dissemination. And the calendars also useful from an asset pricing perspective in the sense that this even week effect probably can be a risk premium if it's earned following non-publicly known interactions. All right, so here's an example from Belenkin's calendar, a random page in 2011 to give you a sense of what's going on. There are some meetings with staff, calls with one of the Reserve Bank presidents, then there's a board meeting, that's a, of the board of governors, which is a subset of the people who decide with monetary policy. And then there's an FOMC meeting starting on this Tuesday. All right, so with the help of an army of RAs and lots of months of, of coding and reading, uh, here's a summary of how much data we have. So we got data from 2007 to 18 for six different governors, including the chairs, which here are highlighted in red. It works out to actually about 29,000 of these calendar entries. So the, uh, the first thing we're going to do is to, to summarize what are the people doing inside the Fed. I think that's the first evidence, so the comprehensive evidence of what the, how the guys are spending their time. Then we're going to look at which items do the governors themselves view as important by linking the calendars to VIX. And then we're going to try to sort out what's going on in those even weeks when we have high returns and how does information get out. All right, so here's some descriptive statistics. So we have uh, data for 12 years here. So there's less than 100 F and F there's less than 100 FOMC meetings. However, there's more than 700 FOMC calendar items. That's because each meeting might have, uh, you know, two days of meetings, a lunch, a dinner, and so forth. There's about 1,500 interactions between the governors in Washington and uh, one or more of the Federal Reserve Bank presidents. And again, there's 12 of those. So the the Boston Fed president, Chicago Fed president, and so forth. There's lots of internal interactions at the Board of Governors. There's a ton of staff meetings, over 10,000. Okay, then there's about 800 interactions with the media, lots of interactions with the rest of the government, about 1,000 interactions with the financial institutions, lots of interactions also with foreign central banks, as well as various academics. All right, so now let's, <coughs> let's define a dummy for each of these 47 categories. So for example, we'll define a Federal Reserve Bank president item dummy to be equal to one for days where one or more governor calendar shows a call or meeting between the governor and a Federal Reserve Bank president. All right, so what seems to be important? So one way to assess what's important is to, to think about what's on the calendar when the guys are a bit stressed out, uh, proxied by times of high VIX. So we can run regressions of just a dummy for whether there's a calendar item of a given type on VIX at the end of the day before. So this will be a good approach for picking up important calendar items. If these items are somewhat flexible in that they can be added on short notice or they can be can canceled or not on short notice. Okay, so here's what happened. So one row here is one regression. We're looking for high T stats, so stuff that seems to be statistically tightly linked to VIX. So a bit depressing is in the first row, the category of calendar items that's the most tightly related to VIX is redacted items where it's just blacked out. Those are mostly during the financial crisis. All right, now more interestingly, uh, the second most tightly linked category is the calendar items for Federal Reserve Bank presidents interacting with the governors. All right, so let's think about then what lines up with high stock returns, especially in these even weeks. So I'm gonna run the same regression as we had before of the excess return on stocks over bills on an even week dummy, but now I'm gonna include also an interaction term 
capturing the interaction between the calendar item dummy and the even week dummy. And just to uh, fully saturate the regression, I'm also going to include the interaction term with odd weeks. Right. So I'm going to run 47 regressions. I'm just going to show you the ones that came out significant here. Okay, so column one repeats the previous regression for the current sample. And then more interestingly, column two, three, and four shows that the stuff that happens uh, in even weeks and is associated with high, higher even week returns is FOMC items. And that's not surprising as we know from Luca and Ring returns were high on day zero. But then also these Federal Reserve Bank precedent item as well as some Fed conferences. So that's Jackson Hole and some other ones. If we fully saturate the even weeks with a, including a, none of the above dummies here, we can decompose the even week result. So the total even week effect, as we've discussed, is very large. Okay, so for column one here, it's 11 basis points per day times about 1500 even week days. That works out to 164%. Okay, that's, that really is 164. It's like not 1.64%, it's just an enormous effect. Okay, of which we estimate that more than half, so 39 plus 54, happens when the key policymakers are interacting with a smaller role for conferences and not all that much left unexplained. Now, of course, you might worry, maybe these particular calendar items just happen to be scheduled on days when the market would have done well anyway. So uh, let me just show you quickly some hourly regressions to argue causality. What I need to convince you is that returns are higher after the start of a particular call I'm meeting. So let's let's redo the regression now at the hourly level, hourly level, so that's the subscript H. And then instead of just having calendar item times even week, let's split the day up into before and after the given calendar item started. So we'll have post and pre. What we're looking for is that this item in blue comes in significant, suggesting that there's information flow after the calendar item as opposed to the calendar item being scheduled endogenously. Okay, so that is indeed what we find both for the FMC item and the Federal Reserve Bank president items. Uh, we don't have timestamps for most of the conferences, but you can see you find significant effects after the calendar item started. So in the hourly event study, we can also do a standard event study graph and you can see positive slope here after the start of the calendar item uh, for categories I'm here combining the FOMC and the Reserve Bank President items. All right, so so far we have that the best predictor of high even week returns is that the key policymakers are interacting at the FOMC or in these typically one-on-one -on -one calls or meetings. From an asset pricing perspective, that supports our uh, idea that the FOMC cycle is likely not a risk premium because these calendars, as I mentioned, are not public information. So you couldn't follow them in real time. So you wouldn't know when to require a risk premium. Now, so how exactly is the information getting to the market after the key people are interacting? So previously we had looked at formal communication and that didn't seem to matter. And that's also the case again here. Uh, we have tried to control for speeches. There's not sort of more or more important speeches after these governor president interactions in even weeks. However, now we have some data on more informal communications. In particular, remember I said that there was almost 800 media items on the governor's calendars. Um, so that'll be one, uh, one data set. And then we'll supplement that with data from the FED's FOMC speak webpage, which keeps track of all public commentary by the FOMC participants. So the way that these media items show up in the governor's calendar is generally that it'll just say meeting with media, phone call with media. That's actually most of the media items. It's pretty rare that you will see, say, call with John Hilson Rath from the Wall Street Journal or something along those lines. Okay, so that probably suggests that the media organizations uh, are deliberately not identified and thus that these interviews are what the journalist would call on background or unattributed um, comments. These uh, governor calendar media items are also not in the FMC speak, generally not on the FMC speak webpage. 
the FOMC speak page covers public stuff like video interviews. So if a FOMC participant goes on, uh, you know, Bloomberg TV or similar um, appearances. All right, so let's do some daily stock return regressions incorporating this information. So in the first column, you can see it's not the case that these media items by themselves are very important. It's also not the case that media items in even weeks are particularly important. However, if you look at column three, and sorry to have to do a trivial interaction here on you, the, what really seems to be generating high returns is if it's an even week, the governors and the presidents are interacting and there's a media item either in a governor's calendar or on FOMC speak. That's when the daily return is as high as 27 basis points. Here's an event study version of that. So I'm focusing on even weeks and then I'm defining the event as there's a media item in this hour and today has a governor president interaction and you can see that there's a nice looking event graph. All right, so there's actually lots of other sources of information on uh, the importance of this unattributed communication. You may not actually have appreciated that a lot of Fed transparency seems to be driven by dissatisfaction with the use of unattributed communication. So for example, the FOMC statement that they started issuing in 1994, whenever they had changed policy, emerged following congressional pressure for transparency after a series of newspaper stories that reveal confidential Fed information. Similarly, with the, the FOMC press conferences may also have been a response to uh, leaks by some of the policymakers. In Governor Meyer's book from 2004, he says, the use of reporters as part of the Fed Signal Corps is not official board or FOMC doctrine. The public affairs staff and the chairman like to pretend it doesn't happen. Okay, so you can see this is, uh, it's a bit like a detective novel <laughs> to try to piece all of this together, uh, but there's lots of different uh, pieces of the puzzle. And at one point I thought, well, you know, if the guys are so worried about this, maybe they talk about it at the FMC meetings. And so I started searching the, the Fed webpage for the word leak and for various newspaper names, and then read all the resulting hits. So I came up with 114 FMC documents with leak discussions going back to the 40s. And one document generally corresponds to one meeting. So for example, one transcript or one meeting minute. You can see from the graph uh, here at the bottom, which graphs the number of FMC documents with leak mentions per year that you know, if anything, this issue is getting stronger uh, or worse over time. Here's just a screenshot of a bunch of examples of discussions of leaks at FOMC meetings. So it'll be discussions of FOMC information security that we serve banks, uh, leaks to the New York Times and Medi Global Advisors. There was a big scandal about that in 2012. And it goes on and on. If you're interested in this, actually the best discussions is in discussion is in the January 2011 transcript. There's a really long discussion of formulating a policy to try to prevent leaking from FOMC participants. So finally, why exactly are policymakers using this kind of uh, communication? So if you go back to the standard view of how monetary policy communication is supposed to work, their communication is for accountability to sustain central bank independence and also for policy effectiveness in the sense that the effect of forward guidance or asset purchases on longer term interest rates depends crucially on the public understanding how, li how likely how long the forward guidance is for and how long the asset purchases will keep going. So in that framework, communication should be public and on the record. So why are they using more unattributed communication? So it, this could either be done as an institution or as an individual. So let me talk you through those in turn. So what could be the benefit of the Fed as an institution using unattributed communication? So here we can learn something from political science. Uh, there's a nice paper by Posen where he documents that if you look at leaks from the White House, they're not actually leaks in a standard sense. They're more what one could call plants of information in media outlets. These plants allow the center to quote, 
impart information about executive branch policies without officially acknowledging those policies and thereby inviting unwanted forms of accountability or constraints. So if we try to map this to the central banking context, then let's think about accountability and constraints. So in terms of constraints first, generally in monetary policy communication ties policymakers' hands. If it's hard for the public to understand the state contained in the nature of policy. So for example, suppose that the audience for monetary policy communication was just you and I, presumably if let's say non-farm payroll or initial jobless claims came out a bit different than expected, we would perfectly well understand if the Fed had previously said they were gonna increase by 25 basis points and now they have changed their mind. However, if this kind of state contingency is not widely appreciated, then the Fed is just gonna look like it's flip-flopping if it doesn't deliver a policy consistent with what it had led people to, to expect. So in that context, perhaps this unattributed communication retains a bit more flexibility than public communication. Another avenue in which uh, this kind of communication could be beneficial is that it's just easier, right? You can explain policy without having to engage in a time-consuming public debate. Finally, uh, what the political science uh, guys call trial balloon leaks is a convenient way to gauge support outside the central bank for a given policy change or a given view about the economy. However, there's also cost. So obviously unattributed communication is the opposite of transparency and accountability. Recently, there has been lots of uh, listening events both by the started by the Bank of England, but also at the Fed and the ECB to try to engage more with the public directly. I think in order to help sustain independence. Now, what would all these newly engaged citizens think if we told them that the Fed and perhaps other central banks appear to do a lot of their communication in ways that are not well understood, but seem to have enormous impact on asset prices? Okay, so I think that is a that is a key concern. And of course, the more the institution is using this kind of uh, communication, the more that enables individual policymakers to play the same game and also use the unattributed communication. So let me finish by arguing that this individual makeup, individual policymaker use of unattributed communication, I think is clearly welfare reducing. So think of a case where you have disagreeing policymakers. Now then, the way that a given policymaker could try to drive market expectations would be either by posturing, so making firm statements of what policy the policymaker prefers, uh, by influencing, so putting forward arguments, or by trying to spin pub the public's views of what the likely policy decision is. Now, of course, posturing is best done in public, but influencing and spin may be do better done in private if it relies on revealing confidential information. And so that's really why I think we get this use of unattributed information. It is, it is that influencing and spin relies on information that one cannot reveal in, in public. Of course, this is, uh, this is not ideal. Here's some quotes from Bernanke. In 2010, he got very upset about some FOMC members leaking and he sent, said a, sent out a memo uh, saying that it damages the reputation and credibility of the institution if the outside world perceives us as using leaks and other back channels to signal to markets and to advance particular agendas. You can see there with the discussion of the particular agendas, he's concerned that this is all driven by leaks used for tactical advantage. So these leaks potentially could work because they move the market and thus tie the FMC's hands. Here's a quote from Richard Fisher. He's the former president of the Dallas Fed, but he's upset about this. He says, I'm just saying that if we can in every way possible, however we do it, we should try to preserve the options to be debated on the table and then not use the argument that market expects us to do X or Y. What's leading the market to expect that? I haven't seen this discussion in the, in the speeches. So if we, if we think about the game theory here, how is it all going to work out? The hawks are, are going to want to disclose the hawkish internally known information and conversely with the dogs. I'm going to skip the math here and just give you the intuition of what might happen. So 
Suppose we have two policymakers that choose what to reveal to the public about policy preferences at some intermediate date between policy decisions. They both care about not being viewed as flip-flopping. So let's model this by assuming that both incur a loss if someone commu communicates and then the chosen policy rate deviates from market expectations. Okay, so it's easy enough to show then that if no one talks ahead of the meeting, then once they get to choose the policy rate, they'll set it equal to the average prefer preferred policy rate across policymakers. However, if either party communicates with the public at the intermediate date, now their hands are partly tied. So then the policy rate will be chosen as a weighted average between what they really want and what someone had led the market to expect uh, at the intermediate date. Okay, so what will people decide to disclose then? Well, let's assume that the policymakers can within limits spin market expectations of policy preferences by selectively revealing information. Okay, so by that, I mean just that the hawks would reveal hawkish information and conversely with the doves. Then one can show that if there's enough disagreement relative to how much news may arrive before the meeting and sufficient spin is possible, then there's this one natural equilibrium where both parties will decide to spin. Therefore, the spin will cancel out. And the only thing that happens is that you lose policy flexibility. This is exactly the same as the prisoner's dilemma. Remember there, both prisoners would be better off if neither confessed in order to get a reduced sentence, but both confess in equilibrium. So in my example, it's a bit extreme in that the spin exactly cancels out. Uh, let me just finish here with a few comments about the ECB um, and, and, and the guards' efforts. So sometimes the internal information may favor one side, making the other side unable to counter. The main point still stands that over time, neither side will gain on average. To the left here is a recent uh, dovish ECB leak that says ECB projections to show future growth barely above 1% thus underpinning plans to approve more stimulus. To the right, a very recent Bloomberg leak that this is a hawkish leak saying the ECB forecast is set to show more confidence in the outlook. Therefore, additional support is not warranted. And you can see the game playing out between the doves and the hawks. So I have a couple of suggestions for what to do about this. So I would suggest that central banks should avoid communicating in these unattributed ways, especially through very expensive newsletters. Okay, so if they're going to do it, at least do it through a newspaper that everyone can afford. Okay, there was a very bad scandal back in 2012 that led to the resignation of one of the Reserve Bank presidents, where information got to a, a newsletter that cost 120,000 per year. This is this was a big deal, and there was lots of heated hearings in Congress, and I think this constituted a threat to central bank independence. Finally, here's the Lagarde's approach, which actually fits very nicely in the game theory. So uh, a Reuters article from 2020 documented how Lagarde now has a great emphasis on consensus relative to Draghi. She's giving more voice to critics. There's more time listening, longer meetings, more time deliberating. She's even circulating meeting proposals a bit more ahead of time, not just hours before like Draghi apparently did for fear of leaks. In return, she's asking for discipline keep internal disputes out of, a out of the media. Now, this fits very nicely into the game theory because in the game theory, the typical solution to the persistent dilemma is to run this as a repeated game with quote unquote punishment. You can think of the consensus building as giving President Lagarde something she can remove, she can take away from people if they're not keeping the internal disputes out of the media. Of course, it's hard for her to quote unquote punish uh, or remove influence from the right person because leakers are hard to identify but the article describes how this is supposed to change the whole ECB culture and thus make uh, this kind of behavior less acceptable among colleagues who might know the identity. Okay, so their hope would be that even though leakers are not generally uh, sanctioned in public, that they would be sanctioned, sanctioned informally by their colleagues. I put a quote from Posen again to document that that is a standard way that one tries to keep things in control under control in the political context. All right, I'm gonna hit stop share here and turn it over to Magnus. <laughs>
All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Annette. Um, during the uh, presentation, we have received uh, a few questions in the uh, Q&A box, and it's still, um, you have still have a chance to ask questions if you would like to uh, type it into the Q&A box. The first question um, comes from um, David Robinson at Duke University, and um, it relates to the current uh, situation. Um, and the question is, uh, is actually two parts. The first part is by formally stating and accommodating monetary policy for the foreseeable future, has Jay Powell effectively shut down the channels that you talk about? And number two, uh, or part B, uh, would we going forward come to interpret uh, less accommodating policy as good news because it would signal um, underlying economic strength? Yeah, so I think where, where these questions are going is that after a while, people should catch on to this. So David asked, you know, has Jay Powell effectively shut down this channel going forward? I think, yes, if we think that they're as accommodating that they can get, then yes. Uh, however, if you read the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, and you try to look at, you know, is the market fully convinced that the Fed put is there and the Fed is accommodating a lot? What happens is every time there's a new Fed chair, there's a flurry of articles on whether the new chair will also be using the Fed put of accommodating after bad news. And so I think that's why we haven't converged to this point where we are sort of fully maxed out yet. And it kind of, you get these sort of recurring themes, but eventually everyone should catch on. And then what should happen is that when, instead of seeing this weird cycle in stock returns, what should happen is that when economic news came out, we should just see a smaller move in the stock market because there would be some accommodating uh, policy news implied from that uh, economic piece of news. So that's something we'll be able to test later on. For example, whether a given non farm payable surprise has a differential impact on the stock market over time. Um, so we have a second question, which actually uh, ties into the, to the answer you had. And, and it's coming from Michal Dislensky. And he's asking about, you mentioned on the slide that the returns that they saw for the Fed put is unlikely to be sort of driven by a risk premium. Uh, so the question is, which part of the returns is actually uh, of the return is actually driven by risk premium? And how can we understand it more broadly uh, within this framework? Yeah, it's a very subtle issue, the whole risk premium issue, because on the one hand, the thing that I'm graphing in the FOMC cycle is the realized average risk premium. The driver of why that realized extra return on stocks has been so high is that the equity premium has fallen in these even weeks. So in other words, there's less discounting and that leads to high realized average return. And um, that quantitatively accounts for a lot of these high average realized returns. Of course, the, the, the key piece of, of surprising news that we don't have direct data for is the cash flow news. So I focused on documenting the discount rate news, but one would hope that there also is a role for you know, lower cost of capital to affect decisions by households and investors. That's harder to document directly. Um, quantitatively, uh, there's a little bit left once we account for the discount rate news, but that's something that um, that goes back to uh, David's other question about whether one would generally view sort of less accommodating policy as a sign of good news, um, which I completely agree with. A third question that we received is from uh, Xing Zhang and uh, wondering about uh, what are the factors explained in the media interaction? Uh, for example, um, does disagreement in the in the last FOMC meeting have predicted power of more um, frequent media interaction? Um, that is actually something we are trying to document. Uh, I don't have the answer yet, but what, what we have done is we have coded up all these discount rate requests to try to quantify the extent of disagreement. And then the plan is to run regressions of these media items 
on that. Um, let me just say that I presented um, my latest work on this at the ECB's Central Conference last week. That's sort of the ECB's version of Jackson Hole. And after that, one of the top reporters from one of the news articles that I cited, uh, and I we have been communicating back and forth, trying to understand how this actually works. And what seems to be the case is that a lot of the information is coming from peripheral policymakers. So not only from kind of the core countries, but also the guys a bit more out in the periphery, uh, potentially because they have less direct power and thus are seeking uh, more indirect power. And so that's more about the cross section of who uses this information, whereas uh, Chin was asking more about the time series, um, which we, as I mentioned, we're gonna try to test going forward. Thank you. I have a, a last question for you, and, and it's my own. Um, so uh, given now that you have all this evidence on what happens in the US and around the FOMC meetings, you have also mentioned what's going on in ECB. At the same time, it seems like these uh, cycles are not only for US stock returns, they are worldwide. They are for developed markets, including Sweden, they are for emerging markets. So how do you understand how, and, and we, we don't analyze so much maybe what the Swedish central bank, X-Bank can would do or communicate, but uh, how, how do you think about sort of how, why are global stock markets following the US cycle? It must be that there's a global risk premium. And since, you know, if you have the same investors tending to invest across countries, if they're if they get less worried, they're going to be probably less worried about uh, things in general. And so uh, Helen Ray has work on this, also how sort of monetary policy of the center country in the network can, can affect the other countries. I think it's still an open question. There, there has been work actually um, by um, Savor, Bruce Savor and Wilson trying to look at whether there's any abnormal returns around other central bank announcements. So they looked at the Bank of England, the ECB and the Bank of Japan and actually didn't find particularly high returns around their announcements. So one possibility is that the Fed has come out more accommodating than other central banks over this particular period, whereas perhaps at the ECB, the Hawks have had more power comparatively than, than the dogs at the Fed. Mm -hmm. This is still, I think kind of uncharted territory of trying to sort that out in more detail. One thing that's a bit complicated is that it's very difficult to get central bankers to tell you when are the key dates in between meetings. You know, if you, I have actually asked the ECB date saying, when are you start guys circulating kind of the key memos and stuff? And like so far there's no takers in, in revealing those dates. All right. Um, thank you very much, Annette. Um, great talk and uh, an in incredibly interesting uh, topic, an important topic. Uh, and with this, uh, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, and you get sort of an applaud, at least from me and, and from digital thank you very much. The audience. It was great fun. Thank you for the award and thanks for having me. And by this, I close the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you.